Good morning. And welcome to the Congregational Church of Laconia, United Church of Christ. Place them out. No matter what you believe, how you identify, or where you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. And I'm so glad to be here with you this morning. First off, if you don't know who I am, my name is Derek Waldron, and I am the pastoral intern here at Laconia, and I'll be here for probably another five months or so. And then secondly, the more important one, one that I'm pretty passionate about, is that if you feel the desire or the need during the worship service to clap or to raise your hands up or to shout amen or hallelujah, please do so. I would very much appreciate it. Amen? Amen. Thank you. And now as we prepare our hearts and minds for worship this morning, let us also remember that as we light this Christ candle, Christ's presence and Christ's love are always with us. And we are here to praise the Lord. Let us do so as we begin our call to worship and invite you to respond where you see the bold print. God of glorious skies and treacherous depths, grace rains down with majestic power. God of engulfing flames and endless wilderness, whose voice shakes and strips all before it bare. God of the cosmos and of the earth, Come to us now as you come to a child in the shape of a dove, holy one, gently upon our heads. For in your presence, we are all as children, rejoicing in your embrace. Amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. I'm going to invite you to join with me in praying together our invocation. Peace-loving God, we come to you now in a time of trial, trial in our world and trial in our hearts. We ask that you come to us now and settle our minds. Breathe your holy breath upon us, God and allow us to settle into this space. Help us during this time to hear your word 
and allow it to change us in ways only you can predict. Help us to feel your presence and take it with us as we continue this journey towards peace. Be with us now, holy God, as we pray the words taught to us so long ago. Our Mother and Father, who are in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts, as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. I'd like to invite all the children forward for a special message. Well, don't worry, because I'm also going to ask your parents to come up as well, if they could. So, parents, if you would please join me. It's not going to be too bad. Don't worry. You don't have to do anything. If you guys could sit down here on this step, I'm going to have the parents sit in the first pew, maybe over here on this side. Perfect. Thank you, everybody, for coming up. <laughs> All right, so today uh, we're going to talk a little bit about role reversals and kind of how, when that happens, we can feel a little bit uneasy, a little bit nervous uh, when we're put into a position that we're not usually in. Um, we get that a little bit in the scripture today, which we're, we're going to talk about later. Um, where we have John and Jesus kind of switching roles. We have Jesus coming in, who we usually see him as you know, the Messiah, the Savior, the person who does the healing, does the blessing, uh, prays for other people. But in today's scripture, um, John does that for Jesus. And I can kind of imagine how when Jesus is coming forward and asking John to do that, he's feeling a little bit uneasy not feeling completely, yeah, let's do this. <laughs> I'm totally ready. Um, but for you guys today, I'll have the mic on. Oops. I wanted to ask, who are the people that take care of you in today's world, that care for your health, your well-being, 
who prays for you. Parents, thank you. <laughs> uh, yeah. um, now, how do you guys feel if you were to do all that for them? If you were the ones to take care of them. No, not, not feeling confident in that. <laughs> right? It'd make us feel a little bit uneasy, right? But just as in the scripture today, for John, God is there in that uneasiness. That's the time where God comes in and uplifts us and helps us get through that scary, uneasy portions, right? So today, maybe just for now, later on you can all decide if uh, we're going to switch roles for the rest of the day. But today, you guys are going to be the ones to bless and pray for the congregation and for your parents. How's that sound? (laughs) Scary? All right. Well, let's kind of up here. You can stand up with me. I'll stand with you. Pass these out. There you all are. Thank you. They're all the same. Don't worry. We're all reading together. You're not doing it on your own. Don't worry. (laughs) All right. Do you want to hold one mic over here for all of you? Thank you. So let's turn around. Face the congregation. Face your parents here. Don't worry. We're feeling a little uneasy, but this is where God comes in, and this is where God helps us, right? So we're going to hold a hand up over the congregation. One hand, that's it. All right, and follow after me. Supporting God at all times, we feel your presence with us, guiding us, protecting us, and showing us the way. We ask you now, God, to love our families as they have loved us. Go with them, God, in all that they do this day. In your name we pray. Amen. Woo-hoo. Thank you, everybody. All right. Scripture reading today is from the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verses 13 through 17. And as Derek shared, it is a it is a moment where John the Baptist feels rather uncomfortable. And I can imagine, even more so when you've taken into consideration John's preaching and message just prior to this. He's in the desert, in the wilderness, as you know, and there are people coming to him from Jerusalem, the, the leadership of the, of the synagogue there, the temple there, rather, the Pharisees and the Sadducees are coming out, and, and he's giving them hellfire and brimstone. You brood of vipers, who warned you to flee from the wrath to come, is part of his message, um, and that there will be an axe that will chop down the roots of the trees that is not bearing fruit, and... And then into this steps Jesus. And John is a little bit taken back, at least I would be, if I'd been preaching such a message. Then Jesus comes to me and says, baptize me. I'd say, whoa, wait a minute. Sort of what John says. And then Jesus came to Galilee, to John, at the Jordan, to be baptized by him. John would have prevented him, saying, I need to be baptized by you, and do you come to me? But Jesus answered him, Let it be so now, for it is proper for us in this way to fulfill all righteousness. Then John consented. And when Jesus had been baptized, just as he came up from the water, suddenly the heavens were opened to him, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my son, the beloved. 
with whom I am well pleased. The reading of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. Would you pray with me? Holy God, I ask that you bless these words and this message and allow me to do justice to your word. And I ask that you fill this space with your presence and help us all to be able to come closer to you and know you more fully. In your name we pray, amen. So the baptism of Jesus. You know, it feels a little strange because just last week, I could have sworn he was just a toddler. Flash forward, and he's already 30 years old. <clears throat> and I say it's strange, yet it certainly feels like time just flashes forward like that on us. Um, I know, especially for our youngest son, he's turning three in a couple months, and I could have sworn he's just gotten out of the hospital after being born. And our oldest is going to be 10 in just a couple months after that. Um, but with children, it probably is. it's always felt that way. I think we can all agree on that. Um, time just goes so fast. However, in many aspects of our lives today, it feels that we're on fast forward. Technology and our globalized landscape have made it so information can spread around the world in milliseconds. And the general theme of this century has certainly been new. Everything seems to be new or is teaching and striving, or reaching and striving to be the next greatest and best thing. And in many respects, this direction in which we are heading as a society has been accepted and appreciated. We have new technology, new healthcare, which is generally a good thing. However, in our globalized world, there are many things that people push back on or have failed to fully appreciate. This globalized world has introduced us to different cultures, different religions, different ideologies, different ways in which people express themselves or live into their selves more fully. And when introduced to these different and sometimes new ways in which people live, many times we tend to put up walls or enter into some type of mental competition as to what way is right or what's better. These reactions are based off of fear, misunderstanding, or just denial of that way of life. And when we react in such ways, we start to deepen the divide between the us and the them, or the us and the other. Or when one side holds much more privilege over the other, based off the color of their skin, their nationality, their social or economic status. This means that the marginalized group is in danger of much more than just exile. They're in danger of violence. And the refusal to engage with what we see as different has led to oppression, abuse, violence, war, and hatred for the other. And it is my belief that it drives us farther and farther away from the realm of God. And now I believe we see a little bit, a glimpse of this engagement with difference in the scriptures today surrounding the baptism of Jesus. Close here. When I first read these verses, I was instinctively drawn to the glorification of Jesus as the Son of God. I love the imagery of Jesus coming out of the water and the gentleness of the Spirit coming down as a dove onto him. Yet as I read it over and over, it was the interaction between John and Jesus that began to pull at me. It painted a picture of Jesus that I think is vitally important in these days of newness and difference. In these short couple of verses, we can see part of the solution to hate and violence towards difference. <clears throat> when Jesus came out to John, who was a man living in the wilderness, who ate locusts, 
and was clothed in camel hair, a man that was baptizing people in the name of God. Jesus did not exert his ways over John. Jesus did not baptize John as John thought he should, and I'm sure most people thought that was the right way of things. No, Jesus came to John with humility, accepting and seeking out the way in which John was acting. Jesus, the Son of God, the baby who had a host of angels sing over his birth, the toddler who just last week had gifts of gold, frankincense, and myrrh brought to him by kings of the East, is now coming out to an erratic man in the wilderness and asking to be baptized in a manner that is John's custom. And it's only after this act in all of the Gospels that God's voice is heard saying Jesus is the Son of God and that Jesus holds God's blessing. I believe it is through humility, by embracing our own vulnerability and that of others, that God's presence can become known in ourselves and in others. It was the humbling of Jesus and the lifting up of God's position, or John's position, that brought upon the blessing from God. Now, what do I mean by this? Hopefully, I know something that I mean by this. It was a few years ago now, I was listening to a podcast uh, called On Being with Krista Tippett, and she had on uh, Father Richard Rohr. Now, Father Rohr is a Franciscan friar and has been widely known and sometimes criticized for being a mystical thinker. But during this conversation, Father Rohr spoke about the transformative aspect of vulnerability. He mentioned that it is through vulnerability, by embracing our own and others' vulnerability, that we are able to be truly in the presence of one another. I like to think of it as if we are looking through the cracks in the armor that we put on, peeking through the space and the walls that we build up around ourselves, seeing the essence of somebody's humanity. Now, I believe this has a twofold effect. The first is that through these cracks, we're able to connect with each other on a deeper level, an emotional, spiritual level. It's similar to that feeling of how you act or behave when you think you're alone and nobody's watching, and you're just free to be yourself without societies or any, any pressures that you put on you. And when we let go of some of the armor that we have built around ourselves, we're able to embrace that freedom with others and revel in the freedom that others are feeling. And this leads us into the second effect of embracing vulnerability. When we let go, when we accept that we don't know the right way all the time, when we allow ourselves to engage with the other, we're opening a space for God to work. When we place ourselves or are placed upon a pedestal, acting as though our beliefs or our ways are impenetrable, we don't leave space for God's transformation. Now, I don't believe it's a coincidence that God finally appears to Jesus and blesses Jesus only after this baptism event. An event that in itself, in a river, by immersion, is in a vulnerable position, as is. In that moment, Jesus gave control of his body, both physically and spiritually, into the hands of John. In that moment, he let go of himself. He let go of the Son of God, the Messiah. He let go of the position that he was given at birth. Jesus allowed himself to be changed. After this powerful transformation, the scripture tells us that the heavens were open to him. However, I see it as a reciprocal effect. The heavens were open to him, and he opened himself to the heavens. 
Now, what are we to do with this example of Jesus in the face of the deepening divides in this world, in the face of war, hatred, oppression, destruction of the planet? What can Jesus' actions today mean for us? How does vulnerability and humility factor into this? To start, it's important to recognize that when we do enter into new environments, different cultures or different belief systems, we may not know the full extent of that context, and we may not know what is right. The people who are living there and experiencing that space every day will most likely have a better understanding of the issues going on. So when we enter into these encounters, just as when Jesus entered into the encounter with John in his space, we must be aware of the amount of space that we can take up. If we don't, when we assume that we already know and believe the right way, that's where misunderstanding is bred. And that's where the seeds of violence and hatred are planted. Jesus came to John in a relatively privileged state. John knew who he was, acknowledged the power that Jesus had within him, and felt as though he had to give up the space and position that he was in. He felt as though he had to be baptized by Jesus. And like many marginalized groups, they feel they must do when pushed up against the wall of privilege. However, by Jesus humbling himself, John was able to be on equal terms with Jesus. As such, they both created the space for God to come in and transform them. And although it's only a few verses long, I believe this to be one of the most intimate moments in the Gospels. John and Jesus, both in vulnerable positions, yet completely surrounded by God's Spirit. How drastically different would this world be if those of us who hold considerable privilege engaged with marginalized communities as Jesus engaged with John? When we make ourselves smaller and allow our cracks to be seen, when we look at the cracks in people who are across the aisle, across the country, and across the world, instead of seeing the worst, we see God. We see their humanity and allow God to connect it to ours. The difference in their beliefs, their skin color, sexuality, or cultures are simply the many different ways in which we can experience God in this world. If we're going to change this world, if we're going to bring about the realm of God into the here and now, then I believe we must engage just as Jesus and John engaged in these scriptures by being vulnerable, by letting go of our pride and our status, by seeing and embracing the humanity of one another. As Father Rohr says, being vulnerable in the face of others is a transformative experience. We are transformed when we sit in the true presence of one another. When we are in awe of that presence and accept it fully as good and true. That is when God's presence is made known. That is when, piece by piece, God's realm is found here on earth. Hallelujah. Amen. Thank you.
As we head into our time of communal prayer, I ask that you take this time to breathe. Big breath in with me. To let down your defenses, to be vulnerable, and come wholly as yourself to God with all of your concerns and joys, whether we speak them aloud to everyone or you only speak it to God. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. To the God of glory and the God of mercy, to the God that opens wide the heavens and the God whose spirit gently graces us, we come to you now seeking your whole presence. We come to you with open hearts in these troubled times so full of anger and despair. We come to you simply as we are, seeking your transformative power. God of torrential rains and consuming flames, God of creation who molded the earth, we come seeking to be your clay, to be molded into your agents within this world, this world that is in desperate need of your peace, in need of your healing presence, your comforting and life-affirming presence. Holy God, let this be so within us. Transform our hearts, our minds, and our spirits so that we may go out into this world and be vulnerable in the face of hatred, be vulnerable in the face of all those who seek to do harm. Let us allow others to see our inner selves, to see you within us and be transformed. In this world of power, send us out to be the voices of peace, the voices of understanding, acceptance, grace, and love. We ask that you send us out and to be with us as we go out into our communities and into this world. Loving God, we ask you to move throughout this room now as we take this moment of silence to pray for all those who shared aloud and for those that we have held within our hearts, for those afflicted by the horrors of war and those battling to survive the fires of Australia, for those struggling through poverty and those with uncertain futures in these unforgiving times. We take this moment to feel your presence in this space, holy God. Lift us up now, God. Make us whole and send us out to bring hope, to bring peace, and to love. In your holy name we pray. Amen. As we prepare to take the offering this morning, let us remember all of the work that this church does within this community and all of the work that it is further capable of doing. And remember that no matter how large or small your offering is, it is a vital part to this church's ministry and God's ministry within this world. The morning offering will now be taken.
Let us join together in our prayer of dedication. Merciful God, please accept these humble gifts we offer up to you and your church. We give to you these offerings and we give ourselves as well. By your grace, transform all that is yours into agents of peace for this world. In your holy name we pray. Amen. I would invite you to sit down before we go into our closing hymn, because I just have something I would like to share. And if I could have one of the ushers bring up a handheld mic, I would appreciate it. As Derek mentioned, he's going to be going on a trip, leaving for the Holy Lands this coming Saturday. And... As you know, as a pastoral intern with our church, there's, he's, it's not a, he's not paid staff or anything like that. And this is here, all the part of his um, educational process at Chicago Theological Seminary. So I thought, wouldn't it be nice, as I mentioned last week in Derry's absence, that if we couldn't do a little something to help him along the way. So I have here, it's a fake check, I'm sorry, Derek, but... <laughs> But the real one will be, uh, the real money will be, will be Wednesday at council or sometime shortly after. And this is to date. I know there's more that has come in already this morning, so this isn't the total. But we're going to, we hope to send you on your way to Israel with a little extra spending money. And that so far we have, uh, this congregation has collected up $555 for you to go on your way to Israel. So. <laughs> <laughs> but know there's going to be more added to it. And I also have a blessing, a prayer that, uh, for Derek and his trip. But also, Sarah, would you like to come up here and join him? Oh, come on up. Because <laughs> we certainly, as I mentioned, we hold you in our prayers as well. Let us be in the spirit of prayer. Holy One. You hold all peoples and all lands in your loving embrace and arms of compassion. We gather here around our friend and co-worker in service to the call of Christ, seeking your blessing upon Derek and his trip to the land where your people, Jews, Christians, and Muslim, call holy and home. We give you thanks for Derek's presence and ministry among us, for his insightfulness and his vision of what the church might be, and the church he will lead someday. We pray that his trip will be personally transforming and spiritually inspiring as he travels the roads throughout the lands where Jesus, our brother, lived. But not only with Derek, but with all who will be traveling with him, other seminary students, professors, guides, bus drivers. We pray also for not just for a peaceful and safe time for Derek and his seminary classmates, but for peace in the land where our Savior walked and taught and healed and offered hope. And our prayers for peace extend beyond the Holy Land to the entire region we call the Middle East. For peace in Jordan, Syria, Iraq, Iran, Afghanistan, Pakistan, and beyond. And we look forward to Derek's return home and all that he might share with us of his experience. And especially, O Holy One, we promise to keep him and his family in our prayers while he was away from them. All this we pray and place in your hands in the name of Jesus, the one we call Christ. Amen. So we would now invite you to turn to number 563, We Cannot Own the Sunlit Sky. Let us stand.
this world of walls, division, terror, and power, go out now and dare to be small. Go out and challenge society with vulnerability. Go out now and show the world true power. Show the world what it means to love. Amen.